All right, then. Um, let's get um, let's get started. Uh, this is the third um, lecture about the segmentation clock, and <clears throat> what we what I'd like to do. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, this is mostly magic too, you know. <laughs> this is, <laughs> um, this is uh, uh, so what what. What you might remember from the last two days is, was that we uh, discussed breaking down the segmentation clock into three tiers. We discussed, first of all, um, the idea that individual cells could be oscillators, genetic oscillators. We discussed the idea of having autonomous oscillators. Talked about their potential control. Yesterday, we talked about what happens when two of these, two or more of these oscillators talk together and how their timing could be changed and regulated. And we talked about synchronization, changing the period through coupling. Um, and today, I want to go up a length scale again across now to essentially hundreds of micrometers to the tissue scale uh, in embryogenesis and tackle the question about the most obvious phenomenon there, which is the waves. And so I'll quickly um, remind us all of... Hmm. Um, No, it's failed. <laughs> I didn't say the right words. Um, th was this working for you, uh, Stefano? You didn't use it at all. You no, but I mean to laser laser pointer. I think they're triple A's. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so <all right. laughs> so um, yes. Reminder of segmentation. We talk about the underlying principle for the generation of the tissue level waves, which is the slowing of individual oscillators as they drift through the tissue. We'll talk about the control of that, both um, via local coupling through delta notch signaling, which we met yesterday, and also through gradients of signaling activity. And I think you've heard a lot about gradients, and I'm not going to talk a lot about them. I'll mention them. And then I want to talk about the consequences of having waves in the tissue. Uh, the existence of a Doppler effect. Thank you very much. And uh, and then trying to alter the waves to see what difference it might make if we could change the wave pattern. Uh, then I'll discuss open questions. Okay, so um, it's important, particularly today, to um, go back and have a look at the tissue where segments are forming. And here I'm zooming straight to the confocal section where we see the nuclei in the tissue. And we can see them um, moving, and we can see segments uh, being ejected on each uh, at, at the anterior end of the of the pre-Semitic mesoderm, the tail bud here, and re rem remembering that cells are being lost from the tissue on this end um, at the same time as they're being added to the tissue at, at that end, and so the, the the tissue's quite long; it can have up to 100 cells along it. Uh, that number will change during development. Um, and so we, can, we think of, because cells are being continually removed from one end and added from the other, we think of the tissue as a, as a reference frame in which there's a, a drift of the cellular material. Okay, so that's an important way to think about the tissue. So it's not like the animal starts out with one set of cells and then those cells are acted upon. The cells that are in the tissue continually, uh, continually change. So it's a different set of cells that, that are in the cell at different developmental stages. Okay, of, of course, we, we think they all, they all run the same kind of program as they go through it, um, but it's different cells. Okay, so, um, and then this rhythmic behavior, here's the core clock idea, again, the clock and wavefront model, where we have a population of, of uh, phase synchronized cells, and here is the, here's the model where they're all, they're all synchronized in, with the same phase, and they oscillate together, and so the the hypothesis that there's a genetic oscillator in these cells, which is ticking with a well-defined frequency, a clock, that's the hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that this genetic clock is the time scale that's setting the, the period with which the segments formed. And yesterday, we talked about the idea that synchronizing those cells might change the time scale from that of the individual cells to the collective. But still, then, one could talk about this whole tissue as being a clock and having a well-defined period that delivers a signal here that gives rise to the, that, that's converted then into a permanent periodic record. 
again, segment length is the velocity by the, by the period of the clock. So the period of the clock is doing anatomical work. And these are the, the kinds of expectations we have that the segment length and the total number of segments will, will depend on the period of this, of this clock. So up to now, we've been thinking about this in steady state. And so, it's, it's, so this is our sort of collective clock here with a, with a tissue level periodic pattern. Um, the real clock looks a bit different, as you've seen over the last um, couple of nights. And this is the zebrafish, once again, looking at the HER1 YFP transgene, where we see waves of green gene expression, green signal marking gene expression sweeping from the posterior through the tissue up to the anterior. And each time one of these waves arise in the anterior, uh, it's coincident with the formation of a, new, of a new segment. So the arrival of these waves uh, is, by inspection, equal to the to the formation of each new, each new segment. You can see that in that movie. Um, so the waves is what we want to think about today. So now, now we need to think about. Ah, uh, yeah, no, um, that's a common mm, magical mistake. Those are not the waves you're looking for. Um, um, so what, there's a few changes in the reference frame there. So what happens is the wave comes in, and then the tissue, the cells express for a little while, and then they decay. But what's happening at the same time is the axis is extending. So those cells that, have, that are decaying away are being pushed, which is why it's really important when you, when you want to try and analyze it, is to fix one, of the reference, one, one point in the reference frame. And so we're going to look at chymographs today that will eliminate shifts in the imaging plane. But it's a good observation, because it's, it's true in the imaging plane that happens. Sorry, say again. I'm not sure that the, 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 it has anything to do with the tissue elongating. No, I, I'm not sure I said anything about that. The axis elongates, and within those cells, we see these sweeping, these sweeping waves. And uh, it's not clear to me that there's any evidence to suggest that the ongoing oscillations are required for the axis to extend. Is that, is that what you're asking? No, I don't know any evidence for that. So for example, the various mutants that we talked about before, where we had, we'd crippled the, either the single cell or the tissue level um, coherence of these oscill oscillations, still extended their axis at, a, at the normal rate. So in some sense, it, it, you might say that the, that the oscillator is re, might be required for shortening the tissue, because each time a wave comes up, it demarcates, so not the axis now, but the, the oscillating tissue, because each time a wave comes up and then uh, hits the, uh, arrives at the anterior end, it, it appears to demarcate the next set of cells that will be ejected from the tissue. So I would agree that the wave might be involved in shortening the tissue, but not in controlling the axis. I think those are two different. To do. They're both going at the same time, but I, I don't think the clock has anything to do with driving the axis. OK. Um, and then, so this was our model, just to sort of make crystal clear the, the difference between the, the, different, um, the different levels, single units being the individual pixels, the local correlation. So, so the single pixels were the HES-HER transcription translation feedback loop. Uh, the local correlation between the, between the neighboring pixels was the delta notch signaling system that was bringing these oscillators uh, into synchrony. And global organization, where we, we look at the words that are moving across the screen. So that's the topic tonight. This is the sort of the global level, the, the waves, the wave phenomena. So how do you, how do you get these waves um, occurring? Tissue level wave patterns. That's what we want to talk about tonight. So the first thing I want to talk about is what do the individual cells have to do in, as they're slowly drifting through the tissue in order to get a wave pattern? So it's a question about what the cellular behavior is. Uh, and so this is a story of single cell slowing. And let me explain to you what I mean. So this is the pattern that we had in that first model uh, where we had, in the first simulation, where we had all of the oscillators phase synchronized and all beating in perfect rhythm. Uh, together, and so then, as the wavefront moves, and as new oscillators are added at this end, we can that's converted into a permanent periodic pattern. And there, you saw a cell um, drifting through the reference frame of the tissue, but actually being at rest in the in the in the in the slide reference frame, the lab reference frame. Okay. Now, 
if we go inside what's happening in that model, what we instruct the oscillators to do is to tick with a position-dependent frequency. So in the posterior, they tick with the highest frequency. They maintain that frequency. They're all synchronized. And then when they get to the anterior end, we arrest the oscillators. We read out their phase um, just before we arrest them, and then we switch them off. So, and that gives this pattern, on, off. Um, now, if we want to get a traveling wave, what we need is a difference between the phase of neighboring oscillators along the tissue. And a very simple way to do that um, is to s change the frequency across the tissue. So now we can instruct this model. The only difference will be to instruct the cells to slow their oscillations uh, as a function of their position in the, in the PSM. This is, this is what, what I would call a frequency profile of the oscillators across the tissue. And the consequence of doing that, and only that, and so maybe it could, um, is now seen here. And this is what you get. That's the only change. We ask the oscillators to slow gradually. And you can think of this as, if I have a, if I have a row of oscillators uh, going this way, if the oscillator in front of me is going slower, then its, its clock is gaining on mine. And so the difference between our times grows continuously. Even though I slow, it's slowing ahead of me. And so this creates a phase, continuously growing phase difference between us. And that's what's required to get a stripe, a phase difference. So you can imagine going once around the cycle, twice around the cycle, three times. And that would, that would be a, a three pi, uh, sorry, a six pi phase offset across that whole tissue. OK, so um, another way to think about this is, I mean, just sort of a crude analogy, is if you're, if you're driving in a car and you're coming up to a stop sign, you could drive at a constant frequency towards the stop sign and then jam on your brakes, and you would come to a rest right at the stop sign, hopefully. Uh, you may want to go a little easier on the brake pads, and so you might choose to brake more slowly, and so this could be your, ang your angular frequency of your wheels, if you like. You slow gradually, come to rest, and you stop uh, at the same point. So you've got the same, you've got the same starting point and the same stopping point. You just chose the, to slow gradually. Righto. So, and then if you... In that case, in this simulation, if we measure the oscillations of that cell, then this is what that cell looked like. It oscillated rapidly in the, as it was in the posterior, and then over time, it slowed and then stopped its oscillation. So this is the expectation from a theory. Uh, this is important. This, this rate of slowing is important because actually this changes the wave pattern. If we choose different frequency profiles, uh, here was the sudden stop, here was the gradual stop that I just mentioned, we could, but we're free to choose any frequency profile. And then what we'll produce is um, different patterns. And because we can quite accurately record the patterns in the animal by looking at these, at these patterns of the, of the uh, uh, oscillating genes, we can very accurately fit this pattern to a particular um, implied frequency profile, actually a, a phase profile. But then we can infer the, the frequency profile that would, would underlie that without if there were no um, extra things going on. So, so you don't need any coupling to do this, right? There's no, up to now, there's no coupling involved whatsoever. These, these are, there's no noise in the oscillators, and all we're doing is slowing them, and we can, we can get that pattern. If we were to add coupling to this, we could potentially change that wave pattern, and, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But at the moment, I'm just talking about the behavior of individual cells. They have to slow down. OK, in the model. OK, good. So um, do they slow down? And so to test, to ask that question, we're going to go back to these time-lapse movies that we discussed yesterday when we were trying to work out whether the cells were synchronized with each other. And so, so um, now we don't have to worry about having cells that are columnar cohorts. Remember, the synchronization question required that we track cells in a row so that they had the same position in the tissue. This, what, this it doesn't matter. We pick up cells as they come through. And we, what we're interested in is whether each successive cycle uh, grows or shortens, or fluctuates, or what do they do? Are they getting slower or not? And so um, this is one typical cell here. We just measure interpeak distances or intertroph distances, and then plot for a given animal the cells that we see um, and compare it, the length of one cycle versus the following cycle. And if the, if the cycles are growing, we'll see all those data points uh, land in this triangle. So here's one example, one animal, where we saw the cells more or less always slow down. This is January the 5th. I don't know if you can see that from the back, but that's my birthday. So uh, on, on my birthday, everyone's in the lab doing experiments. 
And there's a good chance if you do an experiment on my birthday, then I, I will talk about it in a talk. So that's, that's how it works. It's actually the only time I actually see everyone in the laboratory now I come to think about it. OK, so now um, we can do this for now four independent experiments and plot all the cells that we follow in the tissue. And you can see that um, not all of the, so, so this, these, this is quite noisy, but uh, as you can see by the distribution of, of the ratios, but on average, in these four different experiments, cells slowed by about 20% each time they went, went through a cycle. So this slowing across the tissue is, is, is quite robust. And in fact, you can take that average slowing and you can go back and look at the pattern you'd expect and it matches very well to what you, what you see in the fish. So, so, so I think we can say that these wave patterns, the, the basic mechanism then is that the cells are slowing as they are in transit uh, through the tissue. So how is this slowing going on and how, how they slowed and stopped? So th the question of the wave now becomes, in some sense, how the oscillators slowed and stopped. Okay, so just now that question, it could be through the coupling. Because everything I talked about now, uh, everything I talked about, I said, I said the cells can, can do that without coupling. But we just discussed yesterday how the cells can adjust each other's frequencies by exchanging delta notch signals. So we should consider that possibility. And one other illustration of that kind of situation is uh, in this amazing experiment from, um, from uh, Jeff Hastie's lab, uh, where they've engineered quorum sensing behavior, uh, bacteria um, to swap a signal that at some quorum of density triggers an oscillator. So we, we know sort of by, by, by construction that these cells in an isolated state won't oscillate, so that they're not very much like the cells that we saw from the zebrafish. Um, but this is what happens when you, um, when they grow together, All right? And that is the reporter gene, so the cipherase, which the um, which the bacteria are expressing once they reach a certain uh, density and communi can communicate with each other. So here's traveling waves that are that are generated by coupling. Okay, it's not delta notch coupling, but it's co local communication between the cells. Okay, so and in fact. Uh, there's more than one model where the, the oscillator coupling itself plays a fundamentally important role in the slowing of oscillations. But in, remember, in the model, we just imposed a frequency gradient. We didn't say what, where that frequency gradient should come from. Okay. Now, um, uh, good. Okay, so uh, let's go back to delta notch coupling and test that idea. So remember, delta notch coupling was a, uh, a short range intercellular signaling system involving delta. We're now looking at the delta transcripts in the tissue. So remember that the cells um, cyclically express delta on the surface, and then ligands to notch, and then uh, the notch cytoplasmic domain can act as a transcription factor and cause the Hess-Her genes, which form this negative feedback loop, to be transcribed earlier. That's, that's the model, and we, we talked about that a lot yesterday. So okay, now we're going to go back to the experiments that we yesterday used to compare to look at the synchronization of the cells. And yesterday, we discussed that, the, that we had managed to desynchronize the cells by blocking delta notch signaling with DAPT. And I'm just reminding you that we're discussing that. And this is now by looking, at, by looking at cells in these columns. We've got this desynchronization. So it's important that we think we've properly desynchronized, because it means we also think we've properly blocked delta notch signaling. So the coupling should be off in these animals. But now, we can look at all of these traces and ask whether they're still slowing or not. OK. And the answer is very clear. It's that we, here's all the animals, here's the animals that we've added DAPT to, and here are the data that I just showed you. And so we can't tell the difference from looking at individual, individual cells slowing their oscillations across the tissue, whether they're coupling or not, uh, whether they're coupling through delta notch signaling. So I think. So I think this is really, um, it's sort of a negative result, but I think it's, it's very important because coupling can do a bunch of things to oscillators. But in, in this case, what, we, what this experiment tells us is that, that notch is absolutely required to maintain this pattern. Without notch, that pattern breaks down. You remember these, these salt and pepper sort of Christmas tree blinking patterns that we saw. And remember also that the animals couldn't make a good skeleton under, under those conditions. Um, but... Um, so it appears to be required to maintain the pattern at the local level, keeping cells synchronized. But it's not required to generate the basic behavior, which is the slowing of the cells. OK, so that's an important distinction. Yeah? Yeah. That's, yes, it does. 
that's quite, that's quite typical. Actually, in this particular example, it's even more extreme. This animal looks even more extreme than, than in the wild type. Um, I, uh, yes, that's right. So this, this um, yeah, that's a typical plot uh, of cells increasing in amplitude. They don't always do it, but again, they mostly do. Just as, as most of the cycles get longer, most of the time they rise in amplitude as they do so. Yes, OK. So, right, so other candidate processes. What else is there that might be acting in the tissue that could cause this slowing um, independently from the local delta notch coupling? And the current thought in the field is that signaling gradients, which span this tissue, might be providing that information. And James, uh, earlier today, talked about FGF and Wnt and retinoic acid gradients that were present in the tail butt of the mouse, and he was interested in their roles of directing the differentiation between neural cells, posterior neural cells, and paraxial mesoderm. Okay. I'm going to talk about exactly the same gradients, but I don't care about their role in making cells. I just care about their role in what they do in the most important tissue back there, which is the paraxial mesoderm. Um, and so here's an example. So this is, there, there, there certainly are signaling gradients there. Here's an example. Um, Here's, here's the transcription of FGF. So here's the, par the paraxial mesoderm of a mouse embryo in a lateral view. And um, this sort of experiment, this experiment is done looking at the mRNA. If you let this reaction run for a short time, you see some uh, expression in the posterior. If you let the same animal accumulate signal for a longer time, then it looks like this. And this is sort of one way of showing that there's a distribution of mRNA along the tissue. That's important for technical reasons because in these kind of colorimetric assays in the tissue, they're difficult to quantitate. So this is a qualitative illustration of a spatial gradient of the mRNA along the, along the tissue. And this is, a, this is a, a fluorescence image of an antibody directed against a FGF protein. And here you can see a, um, a, uh, 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 what looks like a gradient along the tissue. So this is from the mouse. Gradients of, of the of uh, signal transduction components like DP ERK, which are downstream, sort of reading out the activated state of, of the FGF signaling, have also been recorded in all these species. And actually, if you want to, to see one, you should have a look at Wei Ting's poster. Uh, Wei Ting, put your hand up. Um, just out here, because she's got some images of this from the zebrafish, and they're, they're really nice. So. Um, so here's the idea then. You know, RNA is being made mostly in the posterior, but as the, as the animal's growing out, and cells are leaving the tail butt and drifting through the tissue, their, their mRNA will be carried with them, and it could degrade slowly over time. So you, you might get an mRNA gradient through, just by being inherited by the cells coming out of the tail butt. Um, and then you have some sort of protein gradient, and that could be by direct diffusion, or it could also be created um, from release from the cells as they drift. So these two ways, that, two sort of different mechanisms that could, could contribute to the observed signaling gradient across the tissue. OK, so this general scheme is also true for Wnt. And the other uh, gradient that was mentioned before was uh, retinoic acid, which is being synthesized from the, um, the formed somites and would form a countervailing gradient. So let me illustrate that now in the pre-Semitic mesoderm um, in, a more, in a cartoon version. Anterior retinoic acid, and in the posterior, FGF and Wnt. And what I'm going to tell you now is kind of, it's kind of a, 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 this is the hypothesis, I think, that's present in the field at the moment, is that as a cell moves along these gradients, it's, in some sense, integrating the, two, the, the sources of information. And it can work out its position, its positional information in the tissue, by, in some manner, integrating these different systems. So um, what, it, what it might do as a result of that um, sorry, sorry. Um, and, as, and as a result, arrest, arrest its oscillations at a particular point. And I think there's actually good, inf good information in the, in the literature to suggest that FGF and Wnt and retinoic acid can change the position in the tissue. Fluctuations, perturbations in those signal systems can change the position in the tissue. Now, something else that's going on, of course, is uh, what we were talking about before, the sustained oscillations and then the slowing of the oscillations. There's no good evidence at the moment that any of these uh, signaling systems affect this slowing. So we, I can't really say anything, but, it, but they could. And I think that would be an attractive hypothesis. 
could imagine that the cell would read off the amount of FGF and Wnt and use that to somehow change one of the parameters in that HES-HER model we were talking about so as to slow its oscillation in proportion perhaps or there is some function of the amount of, um, of signaling molecule it got. But also using these, these signals to know when it should become determined and express um, a marker of segmental determination. So, for example, MESP. And actually there was a, there was a, um, there was a movie missing no, I, no, there wasn't. Uh, you remember the, the movie with the green stripes moving up the tissue? And I forgot to mention the bands of red gene expression that were appearing sequentially down the tissue. Do, do you recall that? Shall I show it again? OK, you've, you've seen it lots of times by now. So, so, he would, his, so that's the two transgenes. We've got HER1 and MESP. So um, I would say we don't really know what's going on. And the reason we don't really know what's going on here is because um, of two different timescales that might be present in the tissue. One is the cells could be acting like a radio receiver. So in that, you, there are some gradients where that really seems to be the case. The cell will be sitting in a field, and it will be over some shorter timescale. It was a good example of, of, of integrating over short windows that uh, Stefano just talked about. Be receiving, OK, how much, how much uh, signal am I getting? How much signal am I getting now? I'm crossing some threshold, or I've, I've, over the last three minutes, I saw this much signal. And so bang, now I make my decision. Could also be that the cell, as I pointed out before, because the cell can just carry in the flow some of the signals with it, it might be that it got that signal by inheritance. And it may not be listening to the sort of moment-to-moment -moment changes in the signaling gradient supplied by, by a diffusive process. Maybe that's not relevant. Or maybe it's a mix of the two. And it's, been, it's just been extremely difficult up to now to distinguish those two possibilities in the tissue because the cell flow is so fast in the system. Uh, so I'm going to leave that there. I might come back to that. Um, so I just want to leave these, these, sort, of, these sort of ideas as, as hypotheses, because I, I still don't think there's any really good evidence that I would, would hang my hat on about how that works. I think there's lots of interesting experiments being done, for example, by waiting. But I think we still don't really know how that works. OK, is that fair, waiting? Yeah? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Um, so, so regardless of how these are controlled in detail, um, we do have waves, and they are due to slowing, um, to slowing oscillators. And so now I want to ask, what is the effect of having waves in the tissue? OK, and so the, um, the, the waves in the tissue, um, um, the waves in the tissue, so are they just a sort of a nice um, uh, epiphenomenon? Uh, or, or don't they matter at all? And do you remember when we were analyzing the effect of coupling and we were asking what's the collective frequency that the oscillators would tick when they coupled with delay? Uh, the, the frequency profile that was in that model did not appear in the solution. So that is to say that at steady state, it actually doesn't matter whether the cells slam on their brakes or whether they slow gradually. Uh, you can't tell. The, the, the collective period of the tissue doesn't depend on the internal dynamics of slowing. Okay, so that's, that's a theoretical result, and it holds at steady state, and I tend to believe it. Um, uh, uh, and so I think for a while, we had sort of discounted the role of waves. And let me, let me kind of um, put this in a different way. The, if, if the system's at steady state, then that wave pattern repeats perfectly with the formation of every new segment. Okay? You can't really tell it was the fifth segment or the sixth segment. The pattern repeats, and then you get another segment, the pattern repeats. And there's a cons as a consequence of that, and this is sort of to restate that in another way, the, we can think about three periods. One is this, this pacemaker or input period, which is the time of the genetic oscillations in the tail bud. And you could think of that as sort of you have a bath, and you're at one end, and you're, you're, you're putting some frequency into the waterways, and then they're, they're moving across the moving across the bath, so let's not have any reflective conditions at the other end. And the waves are arriving at the other end of the bath. The frequency ought to be the same here and at the other end when they arrive. So of course, the, the pattern across the tissue can repeat perfectly. And that pattern will have a repeat time, which should be identical to the input period. Again, think about these this is a simplified situation of the bath. And then the semitogenesis output period is the time that it takes to make each successive somite. And that should be exactly the same, because it's just the arrival of each wave. So this equivalence of all these periods across the, across the tissue 
um, is what we'd expected. The pattern repeats. A wave departs from the posterior with the same frequency that it arrives in the anterior with the same frequency that a somite forms. And so this, this, this genetic pacemaker um, has the same period as somitogenesis. And that's another way of stating the core idea of the clock and wavefront hypothesis. Right? The core and wave, clock and wavefront hypothesis says there's a genetic oscillator, and that's supplying the time, and it's that time that's important, whether it's collective or, or individual cells, that's important for forming the somite. Okay. So is that, um, is that true? And so what we thought we would do was we'd, we'd test that idea by measuring time at different parts uh, of, of the pre-Semitic mesoderm. And this is the result we got. So the experiment, um, you take a HER1, the, we took a HER1 transgenic line. We measured the frequency, of the, period, the frequency of oscillations in the posterior and the frequency of oscillations in the anterior just where the wave arrives. So not the form so I might, but just as that wave arrives. And here's the and we um, here's the signal in the anterior, and here's the signal in the posterior. Now over the formation of uh, of uh, about 20 segments in the animal, and here's the signal in the posterior. And so we could, if we detrend those signals, I think it's a little bit clearer what's going on. Here's the first peak. Um, uh, by the time the signal in the anterior has done 10 peaks, the signal in the posterior has only done nine. And uh, out to, uh, here you can see that the signal in the anterior has done 18, and in the posterior you've only done 16. These signals have constant frequency. They're not, when one of them isn't slowing down or speeding up through time. Both of those signals are ticking with constant frequency, uh, but they're ticking with different frequencies. So this is, this is kind of, uh, this was surprising to us at the time, um, because it violated what we expected to see about a clock having a well-defined period across its um, spatial extent. So the incoming waves in the anterior have the same period as you form somites. So that's what we expected from looking. And the surprise then is that the period of, of the genetic cycles in the posterior are reliably uh, slower than what's happening in the anterior. Yeah. So um, so this this point back here is in some sense fixed because its reference point is the posterior end of the tissue. But this point in the anterior keeps sliding with the formation of each new segment. Now, if the tissue had the same uh, length in the infinite snake, then their distance would be constant, right? But, um, uh, but it's not, and I'll show you that in a sec. So, so this, was, this was confusing. And actually, for a year, uh, we tried to make the result go away <laughs> because the period, the pattern repeats, right? So, um, but um, eventually we had to admit that it was a fact, and we saw it in several different transgenic lines, and we tagged several, we tagged two different genes from within the clock, and all of them gave this same result. So at some point you start thinking that this is true, and what I'm saying is that somitogenesis is faster than the pacemaker region of the clock. So this is uncomfortable because what happened to the clock you might imagine you could make a, um, some sort of structure slower than your timekeeper. There might be delays and stuff, but now I'm saying that, that you're making segments faster than your oscillators are oscillating. What, where's that extra time coming from? Okay, so this can be resolved um, relatively simply, actually. And so what I'm gonna, I'll tell you what, we, what, what one can do there. Um, so before we compared the period at the anterior and the posterior, now we want to c capture the wave pattern along the tissue by plotting this distance and, and straightening it out. And I'm going to anchor this point to the left. The anterior part of the tissue is over here. And then through the whole, uh, through the total elapsed somitogenesis, we plot all the time points down here. And so I think there are two things that are really important to see off this chymograph. Um, the first is that you can see the waves. And these are these sort of ridges of light that are the signal that are moving across the, across the, um, the diagram. And you can see that they they curve downwards on the diagram. And that curving downwards is the, is the movement through the tissue in the chymograph. The other thing that's uh, kind of obvious, but it becomes really obvious when you look at the chymograph, is that the tissue shortens its length dramatically. And in fact, over this interval, it, it, it shortens by about 60%. So now, imagine that you are some sort of Maxwell segmenting demon, and you're standing on this end of the tissue, and you're looking to the tail bud, and you're using the incoming wave to do something, like the arrival of the M um, on, the, on the Moorgate sign. But 
as uh, through development now, you are moving towards the source of these waves. And so this sounds a lot, an observer moving into a, a, a wave train sounds a lot like uh, a Doppler effect. And so, um, and so the Doppler effect is caused when an observer moves towards the source of, of waves. Um, for example, this cyclist moving towards the violinist, which I'm sure has occurred to you many times. Um, it's kind of typical, isn't it? <laughs> Just <laughs> riding along and there's a violinist. And, and so actually there's a, this is, a Doppler effect works in two ways. Of course, you, the sound, um, the, the frequency is higher as you move towards the, the source and it drops away as you move away from the source. So the, the relative motion of the observer is important. This is the version I'm going to talk about with a fixed source because we've anchored the tailbone and because the medium is at rest then. And, um, but if you were a clever violinist practicing on the side of the road and you saw a cyclist coming, you could, you could adjust your, your pitch so that it cancelled out their, their movement. And you know, imagine how confused you would be as a cyclist in those conditions. Okay. So, so maybe it's easiest to think about this geometrically. It's how we can sort of uh, talk about it uh, in a simple form. Time runs down here. This is plotted out a lot like the pre-Semitic mesodome. Uh, for good reason. And as each wave is emitted from the posterior, it travels across the tissue. Its wavelength is, its, is the distance between two waves in this direction and the period is in this direction. And you can very quickly get a, get a, a gauge for the magnitude of a Doppler effect just by counting the arrival of waves and comparing them to, the, um, to waves leaving the other end of the tissue. So here, nine waves leave during this time, but the moving observer sees 11 arrive. And that's that's the, uh, that's the elevation in frequency. More events per same unit of time. Frequency goes up. That's the pitch rising. OK, so now the question is, does, does this situation happen uh, in the zebrafish? Do the number of waves decrease over time? And is the wavelength constant, like you would expect in an sort of, optics or, a, or acoustic uh, scenario? So um, to do that properly, we wanted to convert the intensity time plots uh, into uh, uh, in intensity space time plots into the variable of a clock, which is its phase. And so using a, uh, a wavelet transformation, we can convert uh, each, of these, uh, each of these time traces down here uh, into the phase. And then we can replot that uh, in terms of the clock variable, the, the phase. And you can see we get the same information back, 14 uh, waves leaving the posterior and 16 being received at the anterior. So we've got this 10%, this very reliable 10% offset. This, the segments are forming 10% uh, faster in the anterior than the signals being released, uh, is coming from the posterior. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it is true. It is true. So I don't know if you, by inspection from the, from the movies, I, I might have said a couple of times that as the waves come from the posterior, they change their wavelength and appear to slow down. I said that very qualitatively. But that's what you're seeing in that plot. And there's a way to analyze that, and I'll show you in just a sec, because it turns out to be very important. So good, good eyes. Um, so OK, so that's one embryo. We can now combine. This is very reliable. This is now the median phase map from 18 different embryos. And I'm going to play this. Uh, so this is, this is data. This is not a simulation. It's, it's, it's a median phase data from 18 embryos. And now play this. Um, and so what we're looking at then is the, is the view in the tissue as an observer uh, goes through time. And I think what you can see is that this anterior end of the tissue is moving into the waves. And it's experiencing a Doppler effect. So the number of stripes, if you like, that you can see back here is decreasing continuously in time. So that pattern is not scaling. The, the phase offset is being eaten up as the, as the tissue, tissue shortens. So another way to do that is to count the number of waves across the tissue through time. And you can see that it's continuously decreasing. A word of caution, of course, if I was to make, if I was to try and do this study over a short time interval, let's say I looked over these three um, uh, uh, cycles, I'd probably conclude that the system was in steady state. But when you, when you increase your, your time window to look at a longer thing, and you see that, in fact, the system's not at steady state. Um, so OK, the pattern doesn't repeat. Um, so there's no scaling of this pattern. Um, 
And now we can ask the question whether that effect, the Doppler, is sufficient to account for the 10% difference that we saw. And it turns out that it's not. So this, this diagram is constructed uh, for a reason, because it's, it's approximately the, the angle that the tissue makes. Um, and given, um, if, if it was strictly a Doppler, like you were saying, the, the, the wave didn't, didn't change, then we actually would have expected a much stronger Doppler effect, something that perhaps we would have spotted a lot earlier. Um, uh, but we quantitatively don't get it. We would have got it expected about a 25% uh, effect from the Doppler change in the period. Um, but we only see a 10, and we actually really trust that number. So we need to know what are we missing. And perhaps it's in our other uh, uh, expectation from a Doppler about the wavelength being constant. And you're absolutely right, the wavelength is not constant in the system. And so you can see that um, in one way by picking out a, a particular point in the phase and then looking how long you need to go to get to the next uh, position around the clock, and you can see at this point in the tissue that shrinking continuously during time. So it doesn't shrink uniformly across the tissue, but it does shrink across the tissue all, all, through, all through development. And so um, what does that mean? And so again, intuitively, you can see that by making another wave diagram. And this time, I'm going to take the observer out so we can see what the effect of having a shortening wavelength is. So Here's our, our waves, and now the wavelength is shortening. This is drawn in by hand, but it's approximately the same as what goes on in the fish. And you can see just by counting the number of cycles, nine in the posterior, and now you only get seven in the, in the, in the anterior. So a shortening wavelength in the tissue actually has the opposite effect to a Doppler. It's actually decreasing the, uh, the, decreasing the frequency from the observer at rest. OK, now of course, it, just like the Doppler, this, you can flip this around. If you redraw these waves so that that wavelength is growing, then uh, the obser even an observer at rest will see uh, an elevated frequency. But that's not what the fish does. That's what the fish does. It slows. And so it turns out that you can... Um, so we're actually looking for a name for this. And we searched all of the usual scholarly sources like Google. Um, and we couldn't find anyone like Doppler who had reported something like this happening uh, in a naturally occurring system. Uh, and so I propose that we call it the Oates effect. Um, this didn't get through the lab meeting for, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, so we're calling it the dynamic wavelength effect. And its definition is a time and space dependent change of refraction in a wave carrying medium. We've tr chosen that very carefully. It's, it can occur in dynamic waves, so energy transferring waves like light or, or, or acoustics, uh, even though that isn't the way the the uh, waves move through this tissue because they're kinematic waves. OK. Um, it actually, it turns out uh, that um, uh, plasma physicists use this effect. And we, just, we found this out more recently um, because the density of the plasma changes so fast um, that it's on the right frequency to see a color change if you shine a laser in when you ignite a plasma. So the reason why no one had spotted, I think the reason why no one had spotted um, this effect before was that in order to see this effect, you actually need the, the, the time scale of the change in the wavelength to be around about the same as the time scale in, in the period. Uh, uh, so that is to say, uh, as soon as you, okay, wait, let me go one, one step f further and then I'll come back to compa compare the time scales again. So, so the rhythm of segmentation then is, is, is really in some sense, and you can do the maths and show that you can, you can linearly, linearly decompose this. There's a, a Doppler effect and a dynamic wavelength effect. And, the, and the, their combination gives you quantitatively what the, what the observer sees at, the, at, this end of, at this end of the tissue. Um, so another way of thinking about this is to uh, ask the Hoff. Um, and the analogy I would, I, would, I would use is to say, imagine you're standing at the beach. And um, sorry, imagine you're out in the water and the Hoff is at the beach. And you are out in the water, and you're uh, measuring every time you go over a wave. And the Hoff standing on the beach is measuring every time uh, a wave rolls over his suntan feet. And so despite the fact that you're out here in the wave field, and he's at the, at the edge, you're going to record the same period. Now imagine, so that's, that's the system at steady state. Now imagine you start to uh, sink, and you call for help, and the Hoff grabs his uh, large orange thing. And he, run, he go, goes into the waves, and he swims powerfully through the waves. And then he, so, but he's a good scientist, so he is keeping recording every time he swims over a wave peak. 
and, uh, and so are you, even though you're drowning, because you're very dedicated too. And now you compare the two frequencies. Now, what's interesting here is that, of course, he's going to hit the waves faster because he's swimming into them, and so his, his frequency is going to go up. But the amount that his frequency goes up also depends on where he is in the wave field, so on, on the local wavelengths that he encounters. So this is an analogy to what, what we think is happening, but it's, it's not so far. Actually, to get the full analogy, you would need the tide uh, to be going out at the same time. That would, that would, that would give you the shortening of the... That would give you a, a changing of the, of, the, of the wave profile over time. OK, so... What do we think about this? So this, this, I think we can say that the time scale of genetic oscillations is not sufficient um, to, to describe the period of segmentation. And the key ingredients then are the period of the genetic oscillation. So don't, don't get me wrong, that's, that's critical, that's core. Um, it turns out, though, that the genetic oscillators are organized into these waves. And as soon as you have a wave, th that wave can have a consequence in the tissue um, if it's not at steady state. And that's the key because the tissue shortens and you get a Doppler effect and the wave pattern also alters gradually. We know much less about that. Um, and both of these things contribute to the, to the output frequency that you see at the anterior end of the tissue. Um, I, we, we only see these effects. So let's say you, if you have any wave effect and a shortening domain, you must get a Doppler effect uh, unless your pattern's scaling. You, you must get a Doppler effect. But if your frequency is, is on a different time scale to your shortening, then you'll never see it. It'll be so tiny, it, just, it really doesn't matter. And I think what we've, what we've got here is, in some sense, a, a fortunate um, ratio of time scales such that at this rate of shortening and that period, it really does matter. It, it, it will change the number of segments in an animal. 10% is, it makes a difference to the animal. OK, so, that's, so I think that's quite, that's quite spectacular. And I think, you know, you say, oh, well, it's all just wave effects and stuff. It doesn't really matter. And maybe another way to think about it is that this enables the fish to f form segments faster than any oscillator is ticking. That's the consequence of these, of these, uh, of these, of these waves in the system. OK. Now, um, so we've got waves. And we know that they change during development. And we can estimate their contribution to the observed frequency. But maybe the waves don't have anything to do with this actually forming the segments. Um, and so can we alter the waves? So that's, that's the question that one wants to do as a scientist. So we've got waves. Can we tune them differently? And we can. And now I'm going to tell you about experiments where we tune. And these are just, this is brand new. So, um, and I think this suggests that we can tune the waves and that the effect uh, that you, then you see another kind, you, you see it's another example of a wave effect in the tissue. Okay. So uh, what Bokai did in the lab was he uh, engineered an animal with an elevated level of delta D expression. So we're going back to delta notch signaling. Uh, he was hoping to examine coupling. And so he created an animal uh, where we, he took the delta D gene locus and he inserted uh, a YFP at its C terminus. And then he created transgenic animals with this piece of DNA. And when he did that, he created two stable lines. Actually, he created quite a few, but he kept two for analysis. And he named them both after cities that start with D, uh, Dover and Damascus. And when we looked at their expression, we saw that the, uh, the patterns of delta D expression from the transgene, as far as we could tell, matched the endogenous patterns very well. And I think this is important. If we overexpress delta, we block synchronization, and we, we, we don't learn very much about it. If we knock it out, you saw what happened, the system desynchronized. And this was an attempt to supply more coupling into the system uh, by expressing delta in the right place uh, under its re own regulatory, regulatory controls. So we can estimate the copy number, um, uh, seven copies for um, Dover, and, um, and probably close to, that's 150. It should be about 100, uh, 100, 100 copies for Damascus. OK, um, and the protein expression correlates well with the transgenic uh, number. So we've got antibodies to these proteins. And we can see that as we increase the copy number of the transgene, we see a corresponding increase in the protein that's produced. So the transgene's working. Um, and to ask the question whether we had delivered elevated delta notch signaling, we first checked in the central nervous system. And it's not something that we've discussed at all. 
but delta notch signaling is active in the central nervous system and elevated uh, and, and makes a difference when individual neurons are competing uh, to, uh, sorry, individual neuroblasts are competing to become neurons uh, by a process called lateral inhibition. Um, what I want to point out here is um, three different markers of neurons. And so you can see these um, neurons down the spinal cord. There's sensory, the sensory neurons on each side and motor neurons down the middle. And then there's uh, the trigeminal ganglia is right here. Um, and so this is a wild type fish. And when we remove one of the copies of delta D, um, we see, it's, it's probably not so obvious here, we see uh, uh, an increase, uh, it's more obvious here, an increase in the number of neurons. And we take both copies of delta D out, we make even more neurons in these different domains. So as you, as you lose delta, the key thing to see here is that as you lose delta notch signaling, you get more neurons. Um, now, when we look at the transgenic lines, we see as we increase the copy number, and hence the, number of pro the amount of protein, we get fewer and fewer and fewer neurons uh, in those domains. And we can quantitate that the primary motor neurons uh, uh, decrease their number with the number of um, delta, with the amount of delta. And that's true also for the Rohan beard neurons and the, and, the, and, the, um, and the trigeminal ganglia. So, okay, what's the, po the point here is that as we've tuned the amount of delta in the system, we've smoothly decreased the number of neurons. And that's telling us that these different transgenes are active in notch signaling. That's the point of this, of this control experiment. If you study segmentation, it's a control experiment. If you study neurogenesis, it's, <laughs> it's the main experiment. Um, OK, so now let's come back to segmentation. What happens? So the transgene uh, is capable of completely rescuing the after-8 phenotype. So here's a wild-type animal uh, uh, forming good body segments. It makes 17 segments uh, at, the, at the anus and 34 segments on average by the, in the end of its tail. The after-8 mutant, no delta D, um, desynchronizes. And that's what we discussed yesterday. So the anterior segments are a bit longer. Um, and then it shows this um, defect in somatogenesis. So you probably recognize that from yesterday. Now, the Dover transgene, which has seven copies, uh, completely rescues the pattern formation, the synchronization, and the number of, and the number of segments in the axis. So we think that by tagging it with YFP, by making the transgene, we didn't, we didn't change the activity. But what we saw was that in the Damascus, which now has a high overexpression, we see a couple of things. We occasionally see defects. Can you see there's a gap in that segment? So it's, it's not rescuing perfectly, but it's doing something else as well. There are now 18 uh, segments in the trunk and 37 in the whole axis. So this animal has made more segments in its axis. And that's what we might expect if we'd sped the clock up. Um, so here's the, the data. It forms uh, about 7.5% more segments. That co corresponds to about three more segments, Damascus. The other transgenes don't. Uh, but Damascus does both in its trunk and tail. It's important that it does in the trunk and the tail. It's not that the extra segments are just being added to the end of the tail. They're being smoothly formed all along the axis. But there's more of them, and they're shorter. Um, and here's the key measurement from the time-lapse movies, um, is that, so we compare here, here's the wild type. Here's the after-8 heterozygote and the, Dover, the Dovers. There's no, no significant change between their period. But the Damascus um, is making its segments faster. And it's actually making them about 6.5% faster than the wild type. So this is in really good agreement with the change in the size and the number of the segments. Again, it looks a lot like the, um, the segmentation clock uh, the predictions of the segmentation clock by changing the timing to change the anatomy of the animal. We, um, we wanted to check that this, the effect of Damascus was due to elevated delta notch signaling on the, on the segments because it could have been that that transgene had hit some other gene and we're looking at some completely unrelated effect. But we can remove the, the effect on the period uh, that we see in Damascus by blocking uh, notch signaling. So that, that acceleration, if you like, is notch sensitive. We block that with DAPT. Okay. So otherwise, it's a normal axis. Um, it spends the same amount of time going from its first segment to its last segment. So this is the duration that it's been segmenting. It extends its axis 
uh, at the same rate, and it, its PSM shortens at the same rate. So that would be important if we're thinking about a shortening tissue, right? Because now we now we have to now we have to um, consider uh, that the system is not at steady state, and so that means that means that these two uh, these two relationships seem to be holding. Okay, so so what's going on here? Um, we've got more delta notch signaling. We've produced faster segments. We've produced more segments. We haven't otherwise altered the the body. Uh, one possibility that came to our mind was that we might have changed the wave pattern because we'd been thinking a lot about waves. And so um, we talked yesterday about the ability of delta notch signaling to change the collective frequency of, the, of a population of oscillators, and that's certainly true. But it's been well studied for quite a long time um, that by changing uh, coupling strength and delay, you can also change the wave pattern. And in, in a way, this is going back to, to this, ex, this is the reason why we were interested in testing uh, whether delta knot signaling was required for the cell slowing. So it's not required for the cell slowing. But that doesn't mean that if you put more delta notch into the system, you might change the wavelength. So sort of theoretically, it's certainly possible to alter the wave patterns by, by cranking up the coupling, by changing the, the, the the coupling strength and the delay. So, yeah. Um, so the measurement that we talked about before was um, following the individual cells and watching their slowing in in a in a delta notch loss of function, and in that. Following the individual cells, we couldn't tell the difference between the wild types and the delta notch loss of function. Could, couldn't tell the difference between those cells that were coupling to each other and those cells that weren't coupling to each other. So, to the precision of our measurements. Now, now what does what does that mean? Um, that means that if we go from the level of coupling that's in in the animal and we go down, we don't significantly change the wave pattern. What I'm wondering now is whether if we dramatically increase the coupling, whether we can see the wave pattern change. Now, if, if delta notch signaling is active in that tissue, it's, I would say it's impossible to cut the coupling without some change in the wave pattern. But it might be very small. And our, in our experiments, we couldn't pick a change in the rate of slowing. And so what I'm, I'm not using that experiment to say that delta notch can't affect the wave pattern. I'm using that experiment to say that delta notch is not required to slow the cells down. There must be something else that's slowing them down. But if you take, so that means to say that we have to, we have to take the idea of an intrinsic frequency profile very seriously. And now, given that intrinsic fre frequency profile, let's put coupling on top of it. And that can act to modulate the phase profile that comes out of the tissue built from the, the frequency profile across the tissue plus the local interactions. If that makes sense. OK, right. And now, what I think potentially by putting in a 50-fold elevation in delta D into the system, what we've done is we've tweaked, we've tweaked the coupling strength to the point, possibly, where we maybe could change the phase pattern. We may change the wave pattern across the, the tissue. So this is what Bokai measured. And I'll show you what he saw. So this is the experiments he did. What you really want to see, uh, full disclosure, what you really want to see is us going back to the time-lapse microscope and looking at the fluorescence signals, um, construct a chymograph, and measure all that out. The problem is that um, when we made the, the transgene, we tagged it with exactly the same fluorophore that is our marker uh, for the, um, for the Hess-Herr oscillations. So we actually can't measure the internal oscillations in the system uh, at the moment because of this clash of fluorophores. What we can do is go back and look at the endogenous gene expression and look at the stripe pattern that we see down the axis. We can get some idea of the intensity profile of these stripes. And then we can collect that information for many animals that are carefully staged and, and compare them together. So here is his wild type animals. You can see four, three, three, two, two waves that are visible. And, you, and we can measure the wavelength, estimate the wavelength by going peak to peak. It's not, not perfect, 
um, but, um, but it's a reliable measure of the pattern. Um, now, in a Damascus, we see two things. We see, uh, we see an increase in the number of stripes that are visible along the tissue. So we go from an average of three during these stages to an average of four. And in these later stages, we go from an average of two waves to an average of three. So another way of saying that is we put an extra two pi of phase offset across the tissue by overexpressing these, these deltas. And um, we can, with, with some reliability, we can, uh, I should say, with a good reliability, we can measure the anterior wavelength. Now, why do I care? So the phase pattern has changed across the entire tissue, but I care about the anterior wavelength because if I'm a uh, Maxwell segmenter, that's the wavelength that I'm hitting as the tissue shortening. That I, if I'm making a decision on the incoming wave, I don't make a decision on the wave back there. I make a decision of the wavelength that I see as, as I pass it. So we measured that wavelength, and we saw that it was, um, it was systematically shorter in the Damascus. So those are the green, the green measurement bars across here. And it's about 20% shorter. So what does that mean? Um, if we now go back to the ideas of the, the Doppler, uh, the Doppler effect and the dynamic wavelength effect, um, and we just ask what period would we predict with the Doppler effect that was the same as a wild type, um, with, uh, with this shorter anterior wavelength, we see that we, we predict a 5% shorter, 5.5% uh, shorter period, and what we measure is a 6.5% shorter um, uh, uh, period. So actually, we can, we can account for nearly all of the period change by this change in the anterior, in the anterior wavelength. Okay. So we don't have access to the frequency in the posterior. We know that the wavelength across the tissue has changed. But in the end, what the, the, the signal that's arriving in the anterior is a shorter wavelength, and that's what the, the, this re, that's what the segment is seeing in the anterior. So our model for Damascus would be that, um, um, that the shorter wavelength uh, in the anterior means that with, a, with the same movement of the observer, we're seeing the segments form uh, more quickly uh, in the anterior due to a, a different Doppler uh, contribution in the system. OK. so. Uh, so that's the best evidence we've got uh, that by changing the wave pattern, we simultaneously change the frequency of segmentation. Um, and we can almost quantitatively account for the change in the observed segmentation frequency by the change in the wavelength in the pattern in the anterior of the tissue. I'm not completely happy with this because I think to really understand the full changes that that transgene has made to the tissue, we need to be able to see the waves uh, in real time across the whole tissue. But, uh, but I, leave, I leave that data with you now um, as being consistent with the idea that by changing the wavelength of the pattern, we can alter the output frequency of the segmentation clock. Good. OK, I think we're going to finish early tonight. Um, and. Let me, let me then make some conclusions for the, um, the main points that I wanted to make in the lecture tonight. The first is that cells slow down uh, before they stop across the tissue, and that's the basis for the traveling waves of gene expression. That's the cellular basis. In some way, gradients of signals appear to be involved, at least in setting the position where the new segments form, which would be equivalent to the position where the oscillators arrest. But it's still, it's still unclear um, how this works. Um, the segmentation clock doesn't repeat. This is a really important point. So I wanted to spend just a, a minute on this. So you think of a clock. Typically, a clock has a well-defined period. So it doesn't matter where I look in the inner workings of the clock. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the same period. Um, the segmentation clock fails that test. During, during development, it's because it's changing its length and it's changing its wave pattern, it, oh, sorry, start first. Um, the, the frequency you read out of the segmentation clock actually depends where you read it. So, the, so it doesn't actually have a well-defined period. Of course, from an embry embryological sense, the period that counts is at the anterior end, because that's the business end. Okay, so that's fine. 
But I think in a more technical sense, it's, it's not actually a clock. Um, it also changes uh, through development. So it's, it's internally changing as it goes. It, it doesn't scale. It doesn't neatly shrink down from a big segmentation clock to a mini segmentation clock. Um, its, its internal dynamics are changing as it goes. Um, so, and then I, I, we discussed the, that wave effects can influence the period. And that completes our uh, tiers of effects in the clock. So we discussed how the time scales in the genetic circuit would give rise to sort of a, a, a base frequency coming from the autonomous oscillators. Then we saw how coupling could alter that frequency uh, by, intera by interactions if there are delays in the coupling. And now finally, at this third level, this, this tissue level, I've showed you that wave effects add another modulation to the output frequency. So to understand the period of segmentation, we actually need not only a sort of microscopic or, or cellular level rhythm, but we need to include collective effects at two additional levels uh, of organization in the tissue. And it's, so it's not possible to describe the segment, period of segmentation just by looking at an individual cell. It's not there. It's not actually in the single cell. It only emerges once all of these effects uh, come, come up together. And there could be more that we don't know about yet. But, but I think that, that, to me, just well, personally, that's extremely exciting. Um, to see the richness of dynamics in um, in this in this piece of tissue in an embryo. Okay, um, and finally, I think the last point uh, we we looked at was the coupling uh, itself can affect the wave pattern, and that, that has a consequence to the uh, to the uh, the timing and the actually the anatomy of the animal that that results. Okay, um, so uh, don't let me fool you into thinking we understand what's going on. Uh, this would be when James would put up his hand and say, but, you know, why doesn't this all fit neatly together? And it, it, it doesn't yet. And there's lots of things that we don't know. And one of the sort of embarrassing things in a way that I didn't talk about today, but I think it's a really interesting question, and this is something that um, we were discussing the other day, is, um, is where exactly in the pre-Semitic mesoderm is the decision being made to make a new boundary? And in... In what I talked about today, the assumption was that it's being made where the waves stop, that the, that the arrest front of the genetic oscillations is where all the heavy lifting is being done, in a sense, biologically. And in, in a biological sense, we would call that um, a determination front, where the cells become determined to their fate. But there is evidence to suggest that the cells might be making, might be making starting to make decisions before the oscillators have stopped. And that, that, to my mind, is not yet reconciled. Whether, whether that means it's just a small, is it a small modulation? Do we just need to check what the waves are doing back a few micrometers into the tissue? Or have we really missed something? And so I, I don't know. I think we need, that's one of the major questions in my mind. How, how does, I think what we don't understand is how do we get the precision that we see in the system? How do we get consistently the right length of segments? There's a whole bunch of, a uh, whole set of areas where noise can be entering into this process. Um, synchronization is a great way to reduce noise, but as soon as we have these um, tissue level uh, processes, then we, we sort of have to trade off with other things like the movement of the cells, um, the movement of this, of this front, all of those can have noise as well. And one way to think about that is to, to wonder how the left and right hand sides are symmetrical. Because if you're thinking about a process that's being transported up each side, and yet each of the, the target tissues on the left and right, which anatomically are completely separated in the animal, there's this idea that the left and right hand sides of your body, at least in your skeleton, are completely symmetrical. And I, I think that's an open question. I'm not, I, I think we don't know how symmetrical they actually are when they form. And I think that's something that, that would, would be really interesting to, to look at in more detail. The, the role of cell flow, I think, is important. And I've been coming back to this over and over again. And it plays an important role in trying to understand this difference or the, the sort of contribution of maybe diffusive signaling in the tissue versus advective transport of signals in the tissue and their balance. That's actually would be what you would call the Peclet number uh, in the tissue, the, the ratio of uh, diffusive to advective transport. And we, I think we don't know. But the, the, the cell flow in the reference frame of the tissue is so fast 
that we really ought to consider that that advective transport might be sufficient. Um, and I'm, and and finally, I suppose, you know, I've sort of skirted around this. Uh, what is the mechanism of slowing the cells? How, how do they actually slow down? And I think that is, we, we, I think we know almost nothing about that at all. And so I'm deeply curious. For a while, it appeared to be sort of a, a baroque interest. If you don't think the waves make any difference, in steady state they don't, then exactly how they slow is sort of, it's sort of academic or baroque interest, right? But once you realize that the waves set the output period, or at least involved in setting the output period, now it matters how you slow the oscillators because that's going to affect your output period. So, so how does that ha work? I don't know, and I'm going to offer you one last little tidbit, um, which is an experiment where, um, where a couple of people in the lab pulled individual cells out of the tail bud and they put them into culture uh, in the absence of any of the gradients. And this is one of the reasons why I think we don't really understand the gradients, this, this result. And this is um, everything else I've tried to tell you has been um, thinking about what, what, um, what's been published and collectively as a field what I think we know and what I think we don't know. And this, is, we def this next bit is we definitely don't know um, and it's not published, but have a look at this. Here's a cell that Laurel pulled out of the um, posterior end of the animal, put it into culture. There's no growth factors. There's no wint, there's no retinoic acid, there's no FGF. And what this cell does uh, is it oscillates, its amplitude grows, it slows down, it stops, and then it differentiates. So this is something I leave, that's the last thing I, I, the last piece of thing that I want to give to you. I find this deeply interesting. Here's a, so it, uh, if, if we believe this, and so I'm showing you a typical cell, but we've seen hundreds of them, and this is very, very reliable. And what this means then is that the cells coming out of the posterior of the tissue and entering into the flow, they already have all the information they need to qualitatively run the whole program that gives rise to the stripes, the slowing, the rest, and, and the differentiation. And so, and so that doesn't leave uh, diffusive signaling at long range across the tissue with very much left to do in terms of producing the behavior. Perhaps what it does is it uh, coordinates the behavior. Perhaps that's what it's doing. It's not instructing the cells what to do, but it's telling them, do it all at the same time. Uh, so I leave you, leave you with that speculation. And I'm looking forward to teasing this stuff apart in vitro now. Okay, thank you very much.